Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, today, I'm trying to convince you that pain is actually a perception and not a sensation. Here's a photograph of Andy Murray after the Washington Open in 2018. And the commentator thought that Andy Murray was overcome with the emotion of victory. But in fact, later on, Andy Murray went on to describe that this was the point at which he felt he was broken. He was broken by his pain. Andy Murray had developed persistent pain in his hip. No treatment seemed to be working. And this is what he said about it. It was consuming like all of my thoughts. I was worried about it all of the time. Unfortunately, Andy Murray's not alone. Some 40% of the UK population and 20% of the world population live with daily pain. This has led the World Health Assembly to declare that pain relief should be a basic human right. So let's try and discover what we mean. What, what is this thing called pain? So the old idea of pain, as my intention suggests, is that pain is a sensation. And this really dates back to the time of the French philosopher and neuroscientist René Descartes. He gave the idea that we have specific pathways for each specific stimuli we're able to feel as human beings. In this case, he was depicting what he called the pain pathway. But he also described similar pathways for touch and for vision. And what he really was getting at was that whenever we um, have one of these stimuli, it will always produce the same response. But I want you to consider this. This went viral on the internet a couple of years ago. This dress, we had people sat in the same room looking at the same image, not able to decide really what colours it was. You know, I, I can never see the true colour, which is black and blue. Most people actually didn't see the real colour. They saw the white and gold. But if Descartes was correct, everyone looking at that image would have seen exactly the same colours. So I would suggest that the ideas of Descartes, which still dominate our understanding of pain and its management, should firmly be put in a non-recycling bin. So what is this thing called perception? And why is pain a perception? So let's delve into what perceptions really are. This is an image taken at the back of the Rose Theatre on a slightly different day to the day. And if we were to try and walk our way through this, actually to achieve that task, we're facing a lot of what's called sensory noise. Now, we're not talking about sound per se. We're talking about a lot of unexpected activity with the people you see in the sea. And how we do that is based on our perceptions. And how we do that is to take our experiences of being in crowded situations before and try to predict what might happen. And also, we rely on social etiquette, how people are likely to behave in that sort of situation. And to do that, we need a nervous system that is not this. This is a couch potato. Descartes' ideas propose that your brain and your nervous system act rather like a cognitive couch potato, just waiting for information to flow into the system and then doing something about it. But what we now know, and we have a model called predictive processing that tells us something about this, is the brain and the nervous system are continuously predicting what's likely to happen to us. And we only use the sensory information to either confirm that those predictions are correct or to negate them. Now, if the sensory stimuli confirm those predictions, nothing needs to happen. We've got a relatively good model that can explain away what's going on. However, if we have negation of the prediction, then we send sensory signals up towards the higher centers. This is vastly different to Descartes' model, where information is transferred from the periphery up to the brain without any filtering or alteration. And what this really depends on is a series of models throughout the nervous system. And they're not made of wood, as this diagram shows, but they're made of neural networks and neural connections. And some of you will have read about the term plasticity, neuroplasticity. And some of you, if you have, will think this takes place over weeks or months or years. But this is a dynamic that happens all the time. In fact, one of the pleasures of standing here and right now is I'm changing the way in which your nervous system is wired. And there's good news and bad news within that story because neuroplasticity can be adaptive, can be fit for purpose, 
or it can be maladaptive, causing problems. We'll talk more about that in a second. And what we're really getting at is regularities. Here I am with my friend, Alfred Einstein. And what you're looking at is a mask of Einstein's face. And if I rotate his face 180 degrees, this mask, I don't know how well you can see it, but you're probably still seeing Einstein's nose come out towards you, even though what you're looking at is the concavity. I'll turn it around this side. And what, why is that? And that's because one of the firmest regularities you have, which is formed very early in development, is that noses come out from faces. And that's what we should expect. So that's the regularity. In fact, you're probably worried every time you meet someone whose nose doesn't come out from their face. <laughs> and you should be. But these are formed, these models are formed by interaction with our world and taking action on our world. Babies continuously play and interact with objects, putting them in their mouth because it's the first place in which they can sense objects. And we should continue to play and we should continue to manipulate things and we should continue to discover so that we broaden our repertoire of models as we develop. And have you ever wondered why, after going to the dentist and having a tooth extraction, you feel the huge desire, even though the dentist has told you not to, I get very shirty about this, to not put your tongue in the socket. <laughs> but the reason you're doing that is to try and rediscover, to get a new mouth feel, to try and find a new model of what your new mouth feels like. I noticed some of you made a small sound when you saw this. Some of you probably felt very uncomfortable. And that's because you're not just trying to make sense of yourself, you're also trying to make sense of other people you interact with. You're trying to make sense of situations you find yourself in. And an important thing is in perceptions is that you can only ever attend to one perception at any point in time. There is no such thing for anybody, however talented they are, for dual tasking or multitasking. You can switch tasks quickly, but you can't concentrate on one thing more than another. And I would suggest that pain as primacy, you will attend to pain over other perceptions. If you like, pain cuts through the noise of daily life. So what's the value of thinking of pain as a perception? Well, it might make sense of situations where we know we can have pain without damage and we can have damage without pain. So this is an example that was written up in a medical journal about 20 years ago now, where a builder jumped off some scaffolding and a nail, 15-inch nail, penetrated his boot. He was taken straight away by his colleagues to the accident and emergency department, showing all the cardinal signs of being in agony, being in pain. He was vocalising, he was very protective, he was sweating profusely. And he was taken off to the x-ray department. When he was brought back to the examination room, the doctor who was examining swiftly removed the boot. He yet let out a yelp, but then immediately started to laugh. The doctor showed him the x-ray, and the nail had penetrated the space between the big toe and the second toe. It hadn't gone to, into any of his tissue at all. This is an example of pain without any physical damage or any stimuli. If Descartes was right and pain was a sensation, there's no reason this would have hurt. Pain is a perception. And equally, the opposite is true. This is an example from the American Civil War. This guy's had his arm blown off by a cannonball. And the record that went alongside this said that he felt no pain at the time. He was incredibly serene and calm. And only two hours after he had the wound repaired did he start to experience any pain and report pain. There's gross amounts of tissue damage here, but no perception of pain. Pain is a perception, not a sensation. And this has led some people, however, to think that all pain is in your brain. And this is quite an understandable assumption to make. However, I believe, and many other people believe, it's incorrect. 
This is a person who was born congenitally insensitive to pain. Then he has small changes in their genetics that mean that they cannot put the first input of noxious stimuli, damaging or dangerous stimuli, from the periphery. And these people never, ever have a pain experience. By the way, they generally die young. This person died when he was 21. And the reason why they probably never experience pain is they've never been able to formulate the models which underpin our perception of pain. Perhaps where all this comes together best is the understanding of placebos or nocebos, where we can give an inert compound like sugar or saline to somebody and do it in the right context, in the right environment, do it in an almost medically theatrical way. And many people will report an analgesic effect. But equally, there's an opposite effect, the nocebo response, where if people have negative attention, negative expectation, negative understanding of what the treatment's about, their pain, in fact, gets worse. So what does all this mean for the treatment of pain or the management of pain? Well, unfortunately, we're right at the edge of an abyss. In the US and in Australia, they've fallen the other side of the chasm. They're deeply ingrained in the opioid epidemic. We are really just about to fall into it if we don't do the right things. And unfortunately, there's no evidence that people are motivating forces to do those things. So people are dying because of our gold standard drug for pain. And many of the drugs and many of the other treatments we have for pain are formulated in this idea that pain is a sensation, not a perception. So could the idea that pain is a perception and not a sensation lead to newer and different forms of treatment? And actually, it already has. Many pain management groups around the world are employing the principles and the practice of meditation as part of their therapy. Now, the good news is you don't have to shave your head or dress in red robes or sit on a beach to be mindful. You can be mindful wherever you are. Many of you have probably been mindful right a second. I hope you are. All right? How does mindfulness work? We think that it improves the flexibility of those models that the nervous system builds. And pain, uh, patients who suffer in pain often have very narrow response profiles to an old range of stimuli that in most people wouldn't result in a perception of pain. But if they are a loud noise or they're put in a threatening situation or someone comes close to a part of their body they feel vulnerable, they have a pain perception whereas we wouldn't normally expect them to have that. We think that that's due to narrowing of models. And this one may be one mechanism by which we can make those models flexible again. Equally, there are techniques of distraction. And this is a great example from the University of Washington, where they've used virtual reality and produced a program called Snow World to manage the pain of people who have had burns and manage them while they're having treatment for their boon burns and it's intentionally a snowy cold sea it's intentionally blue in color we normally relate heat and burns to red and to hot and heat and this is intentional to cause distraction away from their ideas of pain and their perception of pain and it's not new actually it was first really developed as part of hypnosis and in the Days gone by, hypnosis was a medical treatment, not a stage show media. So people used hypnosis in, in management of pain and other conditions well before Paul McKenna came along. And this is from my own work. And what we did is we established a thing called the rubber hand illusion. If we take most of you in this room, sit you down and make you look at a rubber hand and hide your real hand, and then stroke both the rubber hand and the real hand at the same time. Most of you would start to embody, i.e. start to feel the rubber hand as your own. And what we did with this group of people is we established the rubber hand illusion. And then we checked whether or not they'd ever received acupuncture in their life before, and also if they knew what acupuncture did. 
And if they answered no to both of those things, then we re-established the rubber hand illusion, and then we put acupuncture needles into their rubber hand. And then we tested the sensation on their real hand that never had acupuncture. And we showed that their sensitivity to potentially painful stimuli like heat, pinprick, and certain types of chemicals were all reduced. They'd had an analgesic effect from a stick in needles into a rubber object. Now, if pain was a sensation, it wouldn't have made any difference. But because pain is a perception, we were treating some of these central models directly. And the news is not all bad for drugs, but maybe we need to be a bit more inventive. This is myself. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, not having taken psychedelics. But psychedelics are proving to be a really exciting opportunity for us to use drugs again in the management of pay. And again, how do psychedelics work? Well, all of the literature on psychedelics tells us that they change and make models within the brain and nervous system more fluid, more amenable to change. They alter perceptions. And our early work together with the group of, in, in the Center of Psychedelics Research at Imperial College, we've got some early um, results that suggest that this might be a really beneficial thing to do with people. So I'd like to conclude my talk by saying that understanding pain as a perception and not as a sensation will enhance society's understanding, not only of pain itself, but also of those people who are suffering ongoing pain, particularly those where we don't see any damage, who are told often they're crazy or putting things on. A better understanding of pain in terms of perception rather than sensation will facilitate better ways of managing patients, particularly those who have proved refractory to conventional therapies, who have had no response to conventional treatments. And lastly, together those things will help reduce the individual and societal burden of this thing we call pay. And hopefully will help us achieve a fundamental human right, which is to be pain-free. Thank you for listening. <laughs>